Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about gas pipeline. So let's dive right into it. So why do we need it? Well, the reality is that we need unlimited power, basically this way. Meme was required by the law, so I had to put it here. So we needed that. Now, here's the deal. We have enough wisdom at this point in time is that, yes, we do need energy, but we do not want the carbon emission that comes with it. So we are like, hey, can you give us the energy without giving us the CO2 poisoning? So we are seeking something that has power without that CO2 emission side effect. Thankfully, natural gas, because majority of its energy is coming from hydrogen, rather than carbon bonds, it releases far more uh, water vapor rather than CO2. So for one unit of energy, uh, you're going to get basically 921 grams of carbon if you are burning it through coal and you're only going to get 404 grams of energy per unit of electricity if you're using natural gas. So it's far more preferable. To, you will get power, but you will not get the same level of emissions uh, compared to coal. So that's the whole point. And it has multiple variants. And same, all variants follow the same logic. So you have LNG, liquefied natural gas. You have CNG, compressed natural gas. You have PNG, piped natural gas. You have uh, LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. Uh, these are just tools. They are like same kind of thing with a different variation. And gas has this one of the issues that you cannot just take a gas, yoink it, put it in a bottle and ship it. Can you do it? Yes, we do it. This is India's gas tray. Uh, these trains are powerful. Like each of those containers are huge. So they can carry insanely large amount of uh, basically LPG. LPGs. They move a lot of LPG around and they send the LPG to terminals. Those terminals can, uh, you know, collect the gas, put it into a smaller bottle, sell it to us. So you can do that. But here's the deal. The moment you want to scale it up, like if you want to run a power plant, can you run it on this? Yes. But you have to design it in such a way that it's a consumption is so slow that if you miss one train, you do not have to shut down the power plant. So you will be like, hey, can we have like two, three trains of buffer, all that jazz. And then also you will be throttled because of the throughput. Throughput is very limiting. So if you really need large scale, basically if you're like, hey, I want to run a nation on uh, basically something like uh, gas power plants, at that point in time, ships and trains, both of them do not have the throughput needed. At that point in time, you need to look into pipelines. This is good, but we need something better. So let's understand the categories of it. Everything that has higher carbon content gives you more emission, but it also gives you higher energy density, meaning how much you can pack in one liter of volume also goes up exponentially. So it, it is desirable. For example, if you want to actually fly a plane, you cannot fly a plane on hydrogen, even on liquid hydrogen. Like we can try it. We have tried it in 1960s and you can try it again and again if your government is forcing it, but it just does not have the capacity, meaning your plane will take off, it will fly for a few minutes and then engines are like, yeah, Bro, I'm out, out of fuel. You can see that in like a Boeing, uh, why I'm saying Boeing, Airbus A380 is trying that and they have like four giant tank, liquid hydrogen tanks and a tiny engine. The engine name is Passport engine. Not even joking, that's the name of the engine, tiny engines. They are not trying testing on main engines because if they give that much fuel, uh, liquid hydrogen to main engines, main engines like, so that's why you have to go have basically carbon. Otherwise, you do not have density. So that's why like if you are going from basically pentane to uh, de decotane, uh, basically C5 to C12, that range is what you call gasoline or petrol or uh, many Americans just call it gas for some reason. Uh, this is what drives your car majority of the time. Then we have C13 to C15 range. These puppies are kerosene. That's the backbone of basically modern aviation. That puppy is refined, then filtered, then refined, then made into what we call GP1. Then you do the same thing you take that puppy you refine it filter it then you make it into rp1 rocket propellant one uh, so then you go down you reach the most awesome fuel known to man diesel fuel that is c16 to c18 super amazing super high density rudolf diesel is a genius so quite amazing thing now you go up basically you start to reduce carbon maybe you're like hey i want the energy but i do not want the carbon so you have to go up so you go to methane now methane is the last molecule that you can go to because it only has one carbon you cannot like you know you started well like let's say c18 you had 17 steps but that's the last step methane is the last step that is what we call natural gas now, liquefied natural gas, basically LPG, is propane and butane. Now, those are the majority mix. Be mindful, whenever you are talking about hydrocarbon, they will never ever be just like, this is it. There is always be mixture. No matter what you do, there will always be mixtures. So that's why you will always see these bands. That's why kero even kerosene has a band of 13 to 15. Uh, diesel fuel has 16 to 18. There will always be a band. And natural gas also has the band of like C to C2 band. So, you take basically natural uh, gas. And then you go down 
you go down as in like C3 to C4, there will always be a natural plant or you can get it out of crude oil. So that's how you get LPG. But LPG is primarily made of propane and butane. That's why you will always hear like scientific people talking about like propane tank, butane tanks, butane burners, those sort of things, propane and butane. Those are C3 and C4. Now, if you take that, they are gas in room temperature. So how the heck you use it? If you try to carry gas from A to another, A to another, it's just like you're barely gonna have any energy. So we liquefy it. Now here's the, that's the reason we call it liquefied is basically they're not liquid because of room temperature. They are liquid because we are pushing it, pressurizing it. So if you remove the pressure of a tank, LPG tank, it's gonna turn from liquid to gas very quickly. So we take that, we compress it, and of course there will be always some uh, mixture of other hydrocarbons. So you may find some bit, little bit of methane, little bit of ethane, little bit of propane, little bit of butane, little bit of peptane. You'll always find all these things. And then uh, you're gonna add a stink to it because again, you are talking about humans. Humans are not robots which are like, we connected this thing, that means it's absolutely connected. No, there will be mess. So how do you know whether something is leaking? So again, these things basically, especially light elements, we cannot smell it like, like light compounds, so to say. We cannot smell it. But again, these are very dangerous, specifically once you go to propane and butane because they have the tendency of, of being heavier than air. What does that mean? That simply means, let's say there is a floor, you're sleeping on the floor or even on a bed and you have a gas tank that leaks. Over time, it will start to fill up your room from bottom up. Then it slowly starts to fill up, 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 up. And then it will literally cross your nose line and you will suffocate. There won't be any oxygen. Methane does the opposite. Hydrogen just goes to that uh, space. So that's why uh, there is a very serious requirement that if it leaks every sensor in your body should be like bro something is wrong fix it that's why we put stink into it and we put them in pressure tank the tank pressure is generally around 10 to 15 bars uh, that's how you pressurize that you are forcing it into a liquid state so if you open it pour it there will be a liquid only for a short while and then it will slowly start to evaporate it won't be liquid in like, you know, ambient pressure and temperature for long, unless it's had too much contamination from peptane. If it has peptane contamination, peptane will stay uh, liquid, quote unquote liquid for much longer. So what does natural gas means? Because again, if you are talking about nature, nature give, never gives you like, this is it. Nature will always mix it up. Whenever we deal with biogas, we always have hundreds of contaminations. Same thing happens here. So you will always get like, there is methane, there is ethane, and there will be defined as percentage. So some gas will, dirty gas will. They have like 70% methane concentration. Some cool gas, uh, like clean gas wells, those will have as high as uh, around 80 to 90% methane. That's awesome. If a country has that, that's like, damn, because they have to save so much money in refining process. So that's natural gas. And when you are selling it to someone else, where it's like, hey, I'm uh, basically Qatar and I'm selling methane to, let's say, India. What is the standard? Standard is that you must be above 90% CH4. Basically, if you are selling a container, it has to have 90% CH4. Thankfully, there is a trick that we use liquefied natural gas, meaning we cool this puppy to minus uh, 162 degrees Celsius. At that point in time, yeah, everything else, uh, you know, settles out way before you reach this temperature. So at this temperature, you only have methane. So this is the easiest way of filtering everything. The same can be done on biogas also, meaning if you have a lot of contamination in biogas, like say water vapor, you have a lot of sulfur oxides, you have a lot of uh, other contamination, you can be like, hey, just liquefy it and you can just siphon it for based off a temperature and you'll get pure methane then when you get this pure methane you uh, buy it in liquefied form you do not use it in liquid form you let it expand out but you still compress it at that point in time you have compression ratio of around 200 to 250 bars serious amount of pressure like in psi that's like 3625 psi a lot of psi and this is generally usable. At this point in time, it has enough density. Does it have LNG level density? No, but it's not completely like ambient temperature useless. So it is useful. At this point in time, you can tank it, put it in a bus, car, truck, and you can have a practical fuel source. Now, heavy hydrocarbons always give you the ben benefit of density, meaning you can actually do things with it. That's why if you ever built a rocket with, let's say, liquid hydrogen only, either the payload has to be very tiny or you have to put giant solid booster. Only then you can go to space or you have to use kerosene. That's why Saturn V had kerosene and did not require solid booster, while Space Shuttle had a liquid hydrogen, but it needed boosters in order to get off the ground. That's law, that's the law of fear. Basically, the deeper you go into this, the more oomph you get, basically more things you can do. So when uh, basically Raptor is being built, that's why they are choosing methane. They're like, can we go uh, here? Yes. Uh, benefit, you will get thrust, GG, but it does come with side effect. The velocity is not very high. So you go up. 
But if you go too up, basically you go to hydrogen, you have not enough thrust. At that point in time, it's like, what's the best compromise? Methane. You always have carbon, hydrocarbon. So hydrocarbon, heavier the hydrocarbon, the more oomph you get. The lighter the hydrocarbon, basically up direction you go, low CO2 emission happens. Meaning if you are burning uh, for 10 units of energy, 10 units of energy from methane will have far less CO2 compared to kerosene stage. So if you need X amount of power and you want to make sure you minimize the CO2 emitted from it, methane is your guy. So that's the one. And stinks are always added to this sort of fuel, basically propane and butane range uh, for domestic use. Be mindful, it does not make it that much sense to do it on industrial scale. And industrial scale have multiple layer of fail safe, multiple pressure sensors, multiple of everything to make sure that you do not mess it up. And not to mention those are generally methane level. So they also have the benefit that if they leak, it goes up rather than like, you know, creating a suffocating fog layer. So that's the category aspect of it. Then we come to the pipeline. Uh, if you need to feed a nation, basically, if you, you are looking at India, this is India's pipeline. It's a bit old. It's 2019 map, uh, but it has multiple terminals. Basically, you have Mumbai terminal and all that jazz. You have a lot of Mumbai, Kochi. You have these terminals. All of these terminals have multiple things. Some of them have basically, uh, basically existing LNG terminals. LNG, liquefied natural gas. You get raw liquid methane there. At that point in time, you got the liquid. But here's the, you have to feed it all these things. How the heck you feed it? You use pipeline. So LNG carriers are too slow. If you are trying to feed basically Germany using LNG carriers, it's not impossible. It's just that you need way more LNG truck. So generally it's preferred to just use a gas pipeline. So if you LNG carriers are not fast enough, you use gas pipeline or you have to ship from the port to basically deep inside the nation, like why India is building so many of them. And India is unique in this regard that majority of gas pipeline, whenever you hear gas pipeline is CH4, basically methane. India has a few of them that is LPG. Why? The idea is that we have uh, basically crude oil refinery and some places there we receive methane, uh, not methane as in like propane, butane those things have to be traveled now we used to use trains those are good but again as our demand went up uh, bottled gas demand also went up exponentially at that point in time trains were no longer good enough so we built lpg pipelines these pipelines go to bottling stations so bottling stations can work continuously much higher throughput compared to everything else and voila you can feed all india and this uh, area is kind of remaining at this point in time that's why uh, there is plant gas line there also so India does have LPG uh, basically pipeline, which is very rare. So from refinery to LPG bottling plants, that's why India has LPG. And because India has such a large population and such a high demand for LPG, we have this unique circumstances. Most gas lines are CH4. Like if you are ever talking about like Russia, CH4. If you're talking about Germany, CH4. Bulgaria, CH4. Any Tom, Dick and Harry else, CH4. Generally, it will be CH4 unless specified that it's LPG. So natural gas. And natural gas power plants, they run continuously because again, it does not have the density. So if you try to feed it with a package system, yeah, no, 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 just no. So you have to feed it continuously. Only thing that can feed it continuously is gas pipelines. And that's why Russia is king in this department. Basically, they have natural gas pipelines uh, to other uh, basically nations. So they are not just like, oh, we have natural gas pipeline inside us. They are like, bro, from here to Germany, I have that. And they are so uh, vast in their interconnect is that they have gas field directly connected to some European power plants. Basically, you can put uh, basically radioactive trace elements and you like trace it and you will find yourself at the power plant at the other end. That's how uh, well integrated it was. Again, at ideal scenario is awesome, uh, but in war scenario it backfires on you. And that's why in 2014 they had no balls. European Union had no balls. So how the heck they got their balls? Well, again, renewables started to play a much bigger role, tried to feed 22% of energy came from renewables last year, which was larger than gas. That's why they had the balls to like, hey, no dictator. Let's say no to a dictator. So what about domestic? This is also picking up steam in India. Now it kind of only makes sense in very high density places, Not does not make sense for remote areas. And it's just a different mode of transferring gas. Most of the time, even though Indian households are used to LPG cooking, uh, generally they will be switched to CH4 cooking rather than LPG. But it can be done. Like if city decides that, hey, uh, for some reason that, hey, we want to use LPG, it can be done. Generally it's not done, but it can be done. And <clears throat> What will happen if you like, for example, Adani gas, which is using a CH4, what the heck we have to do? Basically, all our gas burners have to go through nozzle change. All the nozzles will be changed to for working with different composition and different pressure flow. 
in that regard, it's just a minor change, it's like few rupees kind of a minor change, not even one whole dollar. That's how cheap it is. It's just a burners have to be changed and voila, we have it. Now we have gas meter that meters in terms of volume, basically how many cubic meters of gas you have consumed and based on that we get build. Now CH4 does have the benefit that I specify. Uh, LPG is good, but LPG vehicles did not really took off. So we have CNG vehicles. So CNG is the same as gas system. So you can have the same pipeline feeding residential complex, basically people's stove, but it can also feed uh, with fuel pumps. At this point in time, you have one infrastructure that is feeding two customers. And one of the customers are far higher profitable in terms of uh, basically money wise. So it's a very easy way of maximizing uh, utilization. You always want maximum utilization. Now be mindful the pipeline, gas pipeline does not have enough pressure to pressure your car tank. So what it will have is it will go into a compressor. Compressor will feed it to a large tank and it will compress continuously. Because again, you, cars are not like whoosh, 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 you're never gonna have that. You're gonna have a one car, few cars, and then you're gonna have a cool time. Now that compressor is working continuously, so it's gonna keep filling up that tank. Of course, if you have much higher throughput, you will have more pipelines coming in there. So they do require compressor stage, but one infrastructure to take care of two uh, problems, that's far more desirable, and it also has less CO2. So if people are saying that pipe gas has less uh, emission, what that's what they are talking about. It has less emission compared to LPG, liquefied petroleum, basically uh, propane, butane, and those sort of thing. It has less emission compared to those. So that's the domestic gas side of it. Kind of a unique take on this. It has been already implemented in some cities in India link the video down below. So what we can expect in the future? Well, everybody is moving to renewable. Why? Everybody wants freedom. I do not want to live in a country where somebody else going hululu somewhere else, doing something hululu somewhere else. And I'm like, oh, that's why my food is expensive. I don't want that. I want freedom. Why? How the heck I can get freedom? Energy independence. How the heck you get energy independence? Renewables. Exactly how European is showing. And I'm damn sure if that was uh, the performance of renewables in 2022 was amazing. If it grows up even a little bit better in 2023, in next 10 to 15 years, they may even cross 50% renewable energy output because that's how amazing it was. So transition to renewables is going to happen. Now, here's the deal. We cannot go from coal power plant to renewables overnight because there will be a deficit of supply and demand the grid won't be stable. So we use coal at this point in time to stabilize it. But gas is even better. Why? It has super quick response and less CO2. So even though we are still using fossil fuel, we are using a less of it because majority is coming from renewables. And to balance it, it's like, hey, wind turbines are giving too much power, throttle your main power plant down. Coal power plant does shut down, does uh, throttle down, but it's very slag sluggish. Where it's like, okay, 20 minutes to 30 minutes to gas power plant, Tokyo Drift is like, mm-hmm, Tokyo Drift, that's how efficient it is. So super quick response, that's awesome. Less CO2, super awesome. But here's the Once we start to build a worldwide gas network, which every country is trying to do at this point in time, we can just uh, basically do it. Once we build the gas network, we can do multiple things out of it. For example, let's say India gets uh, a LNG carrier and we are like, hey, we are kind of short on diesel. So what the hell are we going to do? Nothing. You can just send that gas into what we call gas to liquid plants. Yes, there is a plant known as GTL uh, technology that is made in like late 90s. This allows you to basically take CH4, make it into heavier hydrocarbon. Now you can actually make diesel or even lubrication oil. Like that's how deep you can go. It's invert process of uh, what we call paralysis. So basically, if you have to deal with plastic, what's the easiest way of dealing with plastic? Make them into fuel because again, fuel emits CO2, which is far easier to deal with compared to microplastic. So you take a plastic, seal it in the environment, heat it up. So you break long carbon chain into small carbon chains. Small carbon chains are liquid and voila, you have jet fuel or diesel fuel, depending how much heat you are using. Here it's doing opposite of that. You're taking a light hydrocarbon, making them marry each other and voila, you get gas to liquids and you can make amazing things. I did not even knew that is a thing, but it is a thing nowadays. So it can be done. That's another benefit. And then over time, we really have to let go of CO2. So what the hell we do? We go to biogas because biogas is a switch on replacement, meaning nobody even noticed. That's how efficient it is. You can just like uh, basically instead of having plants that are extracting it out of uh, crude oil or natural gas wells, you can just have like, voila, I have biogas plant. And biogas has the benefit of that it's carbon neutral, meaning it does not care. It does not add or subtract CO2 from the atmosphere. It's just like it has CO2 emission, but it, that emission will be consumed by next generation of biology. For example, every time we breathe out CO2, plants that we plant ourselves to consume next cycle uh, consumes that CO2. So it's a keep cycling. So where the energy is coming from? Sun. That's why sun is important. So 
That's the whole point. It is carbon neutral and it gives all the benefit, meaning you'll have a grid, you're going to have stability, you have a fast response power plants, and you're going to have uh, basically vehicles running on CNG if you need to. Can you run jet plane on that? No. Jet plane needs very, very high energy density. People have tried every fuel and then it's like, yeah, we can only use liquid hydrocarbons and heavy hydrocarbons. Basically, kerosene is the lightest we can do. We can try with diesel, but again, diesel is heavier, so it has even more emission. Can we try with gasoline? Eh, not really, but again, you can try that. So that's why if you look at Airbus A380, that is like liquid hydrogen demonstration, it has giant four engines, and they're not even experimenting with one engine of that. They have like giant liquid hydrogen tanks, giant, like the whole cargo bay in the back area is like liquid hydrogen tanks, and they are powering a tiny engine from that. Because again, if they feed that much liquid hydrogen into main engine, main engine is like done. Again, density, physics, lightest element on the periodic table, it does not have it. So that's the future. It's a very good tool that we are developing and it's a transition tool and over time it will be transition to biogas and nobody will even notice it. That's the amazing aspect of it. And tell me if you want to learn more about the gas to liquid magic technology. I did not even knew that we have unlocked alchemy in humanity, but we have. So this was my presentation on natural gas pipelines. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press just like, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.